Well, good morning and welcome to Scotts Hill Baptist Church. So glad that all of you are here joining us live this morning. Some of you are watching from home. We're so glad that you're able to join us from home. And in our next hour, we're going to have folks who are going to be joining us in the Crosspoint Center as we stream that message to them as we're launching that venue this morning as well. And we're so glad that you're all here this morning. We have a very busy week coming before us this week. And I know a lot of you have busy weeks, but I want to just give you some reminder of what's happening here at Scotts Hill. This Thursday evening, 6.30 p.m., we are gathering for an evening of praise and worship. We want to invite you to come. We will not have child care, but you bring your kids, you bring your families, you come. We are going to observe the Lord's Supper together. It's going to be a sweet time of just singing in the presence of the Lord, honoring him, reading his word, praying together, and observing the Lord's Supper. That's 6.30 Thursday. Now, we all also have our spring fling, our annual spring fling this Saturday, and we need some eggs from you. Some of you have given eggs. We appreciate that. Some of you may not have been able to have the opportunity to give us some eggs. That, that is, let me clarify that, plastic eggs with candy in it. Don't be bringing any raw <laughs> eggs to us, okay? Plastic eggs with candy, and you can drop those off any day this week, Monday through Thursday, at the covered portion of the Cross Point Center, there will be bins out there for you. If you haven't brought any, just come by any time, drop those off. And then Thursday evening when we gather in here to worship, there will be some bins in the foyer. You can bring some eggs there. If you haven't signed up to help work, please go online, scottshill.info.org. Um, Org. Yeah, that's it. So go look and sign up so that you can help us with that. And that's going to be Saturday. Okay, then Sunday, of course, is Resurrection Day. We're going to gather together. It's going to be an exciting time in the life of our church. We're going to have four services at two times and two venues. And we've been asking you to register for that. Well, let me just give you an update of where we are. The 915, completely full in the worship center. The 11 o'clock, completely full in the worship center. The 915 in the Cross Point Center, completely full. And the, nine, the 11 o'clock in the Cross Point Center is about 85 to 90% full at this point. So we are gonna have some overflows. Yeah, praise the Lord for that. I mean, you're looking at 2,000 people right there, but we're gonna have some overflows and some opportunities for us to fill in those gaps. And if we find that we're here and we still have people coming in and they're guests to our community, I wanna ask you to be conscious to do one thing. Be willing to give up your seat, to go to room 121 and worship with your family there and that we can free up seats for people in our community to come and be a part of the worship time on Sunday. So just be, be conscious of that, sensitive of that, and let's make room for people. Now, this is going to be an exciting week, and that's why our offices are closed on Monday, because we're going to be exhausted by the time we get there. My first church that I served as a pastor was in 1992. It was a little country church called Bethel Baptist Church. It was in Graceville, Florida. And I went there in 1992. Chris and I went, and of course, we brought Ryan. He was uh, uh, just a little boy. And as we go there, I had prayed that the Lord would do some things in my life there, that he would use that ministry to teach me how to love people, how to lead people, and to learn how to be a faithful pastor. And it was a wonderful congregation. The church grew um, immensely. And while I was there, I met a young man and his wife, Jim and Teresa Dunn, who are members of the church. And now they've been on staff here for 25 years. And so it's been a great uh, connection that we had and brought he and his wife along with us. But one of the elements of the service is every Sunday is what we do is there's a prayer time. And the prayer time was usually dedicated towards one of our deacons. There were seven deacons, and each week the deacon of the week led the prayer. And he would always come up and pray during the offertory time. Now, when the deacon of the week came to pray, it was often sweet, but you never knew what you were going to get out of that prayer. And these were days where I had to sit on a platform, and the music minister sat on a platform, and every facial expression on mine could be seen by everyone in the congregation. And so I'm sitting up there one Sunday, um, the, the prayer time went something like this. The, the man come up to pray, and he was going to give thanks for the, out, the Sunday school lesson that they had that day. And you know, many times when we pray, we're praying to God, but then all of a sudden we start inserting comments that we're talking to other people. And you kind of get confused. Okay, you're praying to God or you're talking to people. Well, he did this in this prayer. And that prayer went something like this. 
Dear Lord, thank you for our Sunday school class today. Thank you for the sweet time of looking in your word and learning about how much you love us. And if you were not there, you missed out on a good one. I hope God shows up at our services. Some other time, there was a man by the name of Mr. James Bass. He got up there to pray, and somebody shouted from the congregation. Without any notice, without any clarification, they just say, we need to pray for the bushes and the beans. And so he just starts to pray. Lord, we just pray for the bushes and the beans. And I'm thinking, what? 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 I know we're a farming community, but we're praying for bushes and beans? And then I come to realize after the service, there were two families, the bushes and the beans, who were involved in accidents. <laughs> If you didn't know them, we prayed for bushes and beans. <laughs> but my favorite was a little, man by Mr. a little man by the name of Mr. Bill Kirkland. Mr. Bill was a short man. He retired from peanut farming. And, and he was just a joy to be around. He was caught on fire for, for Jesus. He was learning God's word. He was pouring into God's word. He was trying to learn how to pray God's word. And one day he was going to pray from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where the Apostle Paul says that this mortal shall put off, shall put on immortality. And when this mortal puts on immortality, then will come about the saying that death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? He was trying to pray that. But as he was praying, he says, oh, Lord, help us to put off the spirit of morality and put on the spirit of immorality. <laughs> and when this morality puts on immorality, then there will be victory. <laughs> Half the congregation was shouting amen. <laughs> I'm thinking, Lord, what kind of church am I, I in here? We pray for bushes and beans and immorality. I didn't have the heart to straighten that up because I knew what he meant. And most people knew what he meant. Now, I want to tell you, every time I do a funeral now and I read from that, I am so careful with how I read it. <laughs> more, more mortality. But you know what? A lot of times we get our prayers wrong. And we can laugh at it. And, and, and while, while we have a, a heart to really mean well in our prayer life, sometimes we just get it wrong. But there's one person who never got prayer wrong. He never misunderstood the purpose of prayer. And it was always to accomplish his father's will. And that is the Lord Jesus. Amen. And we see in his life, his life is marked by praying. When you go through the gospels, we see all the time, Jesus prayed privately in Mark 1.35. He'd get up early in the morning, he'd go to a desolate place, and he would pray. We see that he would pray for his disciples publicly. His life was marked by prayer. He taught his disciples the disciples' prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer. And he taught them how to pray. And then we see that the night that he is arrested in the garden, in John chapter 18, verse 2, they found him easily. You don't want to know why? Because it was his custom to go there to pray. And it wasn't difficult to find out where he was. And he is one of the greatest marks and examples of prayer that we find in the pages of Scripture. Now, we've been going through the Gospel of John. We've been looking at portraits and snapshots of who Jesus is, and now we come to John chapter 17 this morning. So take your Bibles or your devices, open to John chapter 17. And in John chapter 17, hear what, what we find. The entire chapter is a prayer, and it is a prayer of the Lord Jesus. Now, I just want you to remember where we have been so far. We saw that last week we were in chapter 13. That's when he is in the upper room. All this is still taking place in the upper room. And we find that the first 12 chapters of John's gospel covers three years of Jesus' life. But the last chapters from 13 to 21 covers the last week of his life. And many of those chapters, five of them, are in the upper room. And then last week, we saw that in John chapter 13, he washes his disciples' feet and he institutes the Lord's Supper. In John chapter 14, he will comfort them with words that he's the only way and teach them about the Holy Spirit. 
In John 15, he's going to say, you must abide in me and I will abide in you and you will have whatever you ask and it will be done. In chapter 16, he goes back to the Holy Spirit and then in chapter 17, he ends his ministry on earth with a prayer. Why is that so significant? Because Jesus is about to transition from his earthly ministry to heavenly ministry. And what is it that he closes with? His prayer. And what is he doing even today? He's seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and me. So here he is transitioning. And when he transitions, what does he do? We see his prayer life. We see that John chapter 17 is the longest recorded prayer of Jesus in the Bible. We see that it is also known as the high priestly prayer. But it's not just a prayer of a high priest. It is the prayer of a prayer warrior. And what we see in John chapter 17 is the heart that Jesus has for you and me and that he is not just a prayer warrior. Listen carefully. He is our prayer warrior. And he still prays for us today. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to unpack John chapter 17 today. Because John 18 and John 19, he gets arrested and crucified. In John 20, he raises from the dead. And in John 21, he reestablishes his disciples for their call. So ending his ministry, transitioning to heaven, he prays. In this prayer, there are basically three things that we, we're going to discover. We need to ask the question, to whom does he pray? For whom does he pray? And why does he pray? We're going to answer those three questions today. For to whom did he pray, for whom did he pray, and why did he pray? So let's begin in verse 1 of chapter 17. We're going to read verses 1 through 4, and we'll discover to whom he prayed. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven, and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Here's the first part. To whom did Jesus pray? Jesus prayed to the Father. Jesus prayed to the Father. Now, you would say that's obvious. That should go without saying But I want you to notice something. He prays to the Father. Now, it wasn't uncommon for Jews to call God Father. But when a Jew called God Father, it was more in a corporate setting. They saw that God was the Father of Israel. He was the Father of the nation. But here's what they missed. They could never see him as a personal Father for them. He was not their heavenly father. He was not their spiritual father. In their mind, there wasn't a personal relationship with God. It was always distant. He's transcendent. He's above everything. He's the God of the nation. But here's where Jesus turns the tables on them. And he introduces the fact that he is father. Five times in this prayer, he uses the word father. In verse 5, and now father. Verse 11, Holy Father. Verse 21, just as you, Father, are in me. Verse 24, Father, I desire that they. And verse 25, O righteous Father. Now, why is it so significant that Jesus is teaching us that when we respond to God, we are to respond to him as Heavenly Father? Many people in the world talk about God and they just say God. God is an innocuous term in our culture today. It can mean anything. It can mean anybody. Jesus specifies it. And he's telling us that the Christian name for God should be Father. Why is that so important? Let me show you two reasons. Number one, it reflects a personal relationship. When Jesus calls God Father, he's reflecting a personal relationship with God. It is a, an intimate, it is a tender moment. In verse 25, Jesus says, the world doesn't know you, but I know you. The word know in the Greek is the strongest word for an intimate relationship between two people. And then in verse 26, he says that you have loved me and I want them to see your love in me and that you love them. 
And so there's this intimacy. And Jesus had this intimate walk with God the Father. He was intimate. He was his daddy, if you wanted to put it, in the most intimate of terms. And Jesus is painting the picture that when you and I come to him, it is to be that intimate relationship that we have with him. Now, Jesus wants us to know him in that degree. And in verse 3, he says, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, here is the best definition of eternal life. It is short. It is concise. What is eternal life? Eternal life is knowing God the Father personally through his son, Jesus Christ. That's eternal life. And he's saying, if you want eternal life, it doesn't happen apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, you can know about God. You can know about his word. You can know about the history of Christ. But that doesn't mean you know him. There's a difference between the two. You can know about Abraham Lincoln. You can know about his success and his failures and his history, but you don't know him personally. And eternal life is knowing the Father through his Son in an intimate walk with him. Several years ago, I was um, in seminary in New Orleans, Louisiana. And while I was in seminary in New Orleans, they had a rule for all seminary students. We had to participate in what's called CWT, Continuing Witnessing Training, which means we had to go to the streets of New Orleans. We had to encounter people and share the gospel with them. And this whole semester, that's what we had to do every single week. And we had to write a verbatim and turn it in every week. So I'm in the French Quarter, and I'm walking, and there was this bench, and there was a guy sitting on a bench. So I go sit on the other end of a bench. And we get to talking and everything, and I find out that he is an assistant pastor of a rather liberal church in that city. And so we're just talking about, and we get in a discussion about man's propositional truth and God's objective truth. And the whole time he's talking, it's as though God is distant. And so I just looked at him. I said, can I ask you a question? He said, what is it? I said, do you see God as personal father? And he looked at me startled, puzzled even. He said, you know, I've never really considered the fact that God is personal. And I'm thinking, this is a guy that is a pastor of a church, and he's never considered the reality of a personal relationship with God? And here's what Jesus is saying. While he prays to the Father and calls him Father, he's speaking of this intimate, personal walk that he has with him. But here's the second thing he says. It's not only a personal relationship, it reflects a submissive relationship. He says, I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. In other words, Jesus is saying, I've done, Father, everything you've asked me to do. And Jesus not only had this personal relationship with the Father, but it was a loving, submissive relationship with him. From eternity past, God's plan was that Jesus would come in the flesh and that Jesus would die on the cross and he would raise from the dead and he would provide eternal life for humanity. And from eternity past, Jesus was always submissive to the desires of the Father. Now get this. Jesus knew the end from the beginning because he is God. He shares all the attributes with God. He is fully aware and confident in God's sovereignty over human affairs. And yet, even though Jesus is perfectly confident in the sovereignty of God and what's going to happen, he still prayed. He still prayed. And this is a warning for us. There are a lot of people who say, I don't need to pray because I'm trusting God's sovereignty. Well, there's no difference in the person who says, I don't pray because I have no hope in prayer because I don't believe God can answer. And the person who says, I don't pray because I have hope in prayer and that God will answer. The result is the same. Neither of them prays. And Jesus is modeling for us, even with the full confidence of the sovereignty of God, there's a role and expectation for every person that belongs to Jesus to pray. So to whom does he pray? He prays to the Father, which demonstrates a personal relationship and a submissive walk to God. Then the next question is, to whom did Jesus pray? 
I mean, for whom did Jesus pray? And for whom? Jesus prayed for individuals. Jesus prayed for individuals. Now, he begins it by talking about that he's praying to the Father, which reflects a relationship and a submissive relationship. But secondly, he says, these are the people I'm praying for. He's going to pray for individuals. Now, it may surprise you where that starts. Jesus begins by praying for himself. Notice what it says in verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. He is praying for individuals and he begins by praying for himself. Now, I've had somebody say to me one time, we should never pray for ourselves, pastor. Really? Well, the Lord Jesus shattered that thought. He prays for himself. Now, when Jesus prays for himself that the Father would glorify him, Jesus is not having this self-centered, egotistical, narcissistic prayer. He's not saying, well, God, if I'm going to do all this for you, then you're going to have to glorify me when I get to heaven. That's not at all what it means. What Jesus is saying here is when he says, glorify me with the glory that I had previously, he's saying this, that Father, I want your will to be perfectly worked out in my life. And your will is that I would come submissively to you, die on a cross, be buried, raised on the third day, provide redemption for all of humanity, and by doing that, that glorifies you. And as a result, you receive glory from my submission and glory to you. That's the picture. When Jesus says to glorify me, it's really to let me do everything from eternity past that has been ordained for the salvation of humanity and not just for myself, but for your glory. Now, that kind of helps us to understand when we pray for ourselves, here's the big question. Why am I praying for myself? Do I pray for myself just for me? Or do I pray in such a way that, Father, I want your work, your will to be perfectly worked out in my life. And no matter what it cost me, even if it cost me my life, I ask that you would be glorified for it. That's the concept. And when Jesus prays for himself, it's always for the glory of God. And this is something we need to learn about prayer, isn't it? Because how easy is it to pray for ourselves that our lives will be convenient? How easy is it to pray for ourselves that life will be good? How easy is it to pray for ourselves that life will be successful? Instead of, Lord, whatever it takes to glorify you, if this is it, I submit to this for your praise and for your glory. So Jesus prays for himself. But here's the second group he prays for. Jesus prays for his disciples. And this is amazing. From verses 6 to 19, it's all about his prayer for his disciples. And when he's praying for his disciples, he breaks it down really into two categories. He begins by he acknowledges the Father's divine work in the disciples. He begins by acknowledging the Father's divine work. Here's what he's doing. He begins his prayer for his disciples, and he's kind of like giving a report to God. You know, you ever pray something and you're kind of giving a report back to God? Lord, Lord, thank you that I was able to meet with so-and-so today and you know what they said and you know how that responded. And you're thinking, why are you praying that? God already knows all that. You don't need to give a report back to God. Well, it's like your kids when they come from school or they come from an event or a camping trip and they want to tell you everything that happened on the trip because they're excited about it. Now, you weren't there. You don't have the omniscience that God has in knowing everything but you want to hear from your children. And Jesus is delighted to say, Father, I want to recount what you have done in my disciples so that you receive glory. That's what he's doing. And what he's doing is acknowledging God's divine work in the life of his disciples. Beginning in verse six, he says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me. And they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. Here's what Jesus is doing. He's recounting God's divine work. First he's saying is this. Father, you've known them from eternity past. 
They were yours before they were mine. And by your sovereign choice, you elected them and gave them to me as a gift. And I thank you for your divine work. Let me tell you what he's clearly speaking about here is divine election. And when it comes to divine election, the Bible is unapologetic when it speaks about God choosing. Here's what we see through the pages of scripture, that the father chooses and draws. The spirit convicts and converts and Jesus accepts every person that comes to him by faith. There's the perfect picture. Now there's a lot of mystery to the doctrine of election and we're not gonna get into that this morning. But here's what he's saying. He's recounting what the Father has done. Father, in your great grace, you have drawn them, you have converted them. And here are the marks that they belong to me. They have believed in me, they trusted me. They have obeyed your word, they've taken it to be theirs, and they have walked according to your truth. I'm gonna tell you today, the marks of a disciple is not just somebody who says, I love Jesus. There are a lot of people who say, I love Jesus, and Jesus will say to them, one day I never knew you, depart from me. The mark of a true child of God is a absolute trust in Jesus and obedience to his word and walking in his truth. That's the mark of a believer. And Jesus recounts this to the Father. And let me tell you something, that Jesus still recounts believers to the Father this day. Because here's the reality, disciples never get it perfect. You and I are going to stumble. We're going to sin. That's why John writes in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, here's what he says. He says, I write these things to you, little children, that you may not sin. That's the ideal. But if anyone does sin, that's the real. He has an advocate with the Father, who is Christ Jesus the righteous. You know what an advocate is? An advocate is a defense attorney that comes alongside you and calls out your innocence. And when you and I don't get it right, the Lord Jesus, even to this day, is seated at the right hand of the Father and he calls out our innocence before his Father. When you stumble and fall and confess that sin, you're cleansed from that sin. And there's the Lord Jesus as your advocate declaring your innocence because of his blood shed for you. And even in this time, here is Jesus recounting to the Father. Up, oh, up, oh, I, I, I know he did that. But Father, look, look at his heart. He's been washed by the blood that I've given as a sacrifice. He is yours, and I defend him this day. And the Father will always defend those who have been given to the Son and whom the Son advocates for in his presence. Isn't that wonderful? It's a wonderful thing that our prayer warrior does. But here's the second thing he does. Not only does he acknowledge God's divine work, but he asks for God's divine will in the disciples. What is the will of God for disciples? Well, he lays it out. He says, I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, all mine or yours and yours or mine, and I am glorified in them. He said, I'm not gonna pray for the world. Now, it's not that Jesus doesn't pray for the world. Later in his prayer, he does. And God so loved the world that he gave his son. But what he knows is the world system is uh, diabolical and um, against the system of God. And so he's praying specifically for his disciples. And what does he pray for? He prays for five things for his disciples. We're going to go through these really quickly. First thing he prays for is unity. He prays for unity for his disciples. Now, if you know anything about his disciples, when you read the Gospels, they're always bickering and fighting, aren't they? Nothing has changed in 2,000 years. We still do it. And so Jesus on the top of his list is praying for unity. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Let me tell you what unity is not. Unity is not uniformity. We don't all look alike. Turn to the person next to you right now and say, I'm glad you don't look like me. <laughs> unity is not unanimity. Unanimity says we all think alike. Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm glad I don't think like you. <laughs> Everything I'm talking about unity, I've just undermined it right now, haven't I? 
But you know what unity is? Unity is the work of the Spirit of God to bring peace in the midst of differences. That's what unity is. Because it's not that we all think alike and we all look alike. We all have different thoughts when it comes to even convictions that we say are coming from the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we're at odds with one another even in those things. But the unity that he's talking about is a powerful work of the Spirit of God that brings us in a center of peacefulness even with the midst of our difficulties. That's why the Apostle Paul prays in Ephesians. He says this, to be diligent, to preserve the unity of the Spirit through the bonds of peace. Let me tell you, we do not create unity. The Holy Spirit did that when we came to faith in Christ. We must do everything we can to pursue the unity that comes from the Spirit of God through peace. That's what we're called to do. Think about our world. Think about our world. Our world says, if you don't think like me, if you don't look like me, if you don't act like me, I'm just going to cancel you. Isn't that true? Why is it that the church has adopted that philosophy? And what have we done? If you don't think like me, if you don't look like me, if you don't dress like me, you know what? I don't have time for you. And it grieves the heart of God. But when you and I have differences, but we yield to the work of the Spirit of God in us for peace, then there becomes unity. He says, I'm going to pray for unity for my disciples. Not only that, but I'm going to pray for protection. Jesus is about to leave his disciples. He's going back to heaven. He says, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, which is Judas, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus said, I've guarded every one of them. I've kept every one of them. And then in verse 15, he says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. What is Jesus praying for? He's praying for protection. He knows that there is an evil one and the schemes of the enemy are all around us and he's constantly trying to undermine the work of the church and the work of believers. Here's what he's saying that the enemy does. He wants to trip you up. He wants to set a trap that will undermine your testimony and to undermine the work and, and, and the, the great process that God has created in your life. He wants to undermine you for all of those things. He will protect you in the midst of all that. But not only does he protect us, I love this one, joy. He prays for joy. Of all the things that Jesus can pray for, his disciples, he prays for joy. He says, but now I'm coming to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have joy, my joy fulfilled in themselves. There's only one time in all the gospel prior to this that Jesus mentions joy, and that's in John chapter three but he mentions it seven times in verses, chapters 15, 16, and 17. Why? Because we need joy. What is joy? Joy is an internal disposition that is never determined by external circumstances. That's joy. Happiness is built on happenstance. I'm happy if this happens. Joy is something that's internal that only comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ that is never governed by external things. And the joy of the Lord is also a fruit of the Spirit, and it is our power. And I want to tell you what, if the joy of the Lord is our strength, then there are a lot of weak believers today. Because you look at them and you look at their faces and you look at the attitudes and the disposition of their hearts and they're not joyful. The fact that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life ought to be enough for us to be joyful until we get to heaven. And we should be joyful people. Sanctification. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. He's praying that they would be sanctified in the truth. That means set apart in the truth. That means this, that the one objective truth is the word of God for our lives and everything in our life should be built around the word of God. We should have a biblical world view and our thought process, our conviction should flow from the truth of God's word, not from the culture not from the mores of what the culture says. 
not from all of the whims and the philosophies that come from us. Let me tell you, the reason many believers today do not have confidence in walking in the truth is because they don't know the truth. And they're listening to the lies of the world. And it's no wonder that so many churches have drifted into liberalism that reflects the heart of our culture instead of standing on a truth that makes them distinctively different from the culture. That's what we're called to be. He prays to sanctify them in the truth. And the last thing he prays is for mission. He's prays for mission. He says, as you sent me into the world, so I sent them into the world. He's going to give them the great commission. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he's going to give them the strategy to do mission all through the world. And the book of Acts is a reflection of the prayer of Jesus protecting them and encouraging them and giving them power and boldness. These five things he prays for. Now, let me just say this. When I list, looked at these this week, it convicted my own heart. Here's what convicted me. When I pray for you and I pray for me, are these the things that I pray for? Am I praying for your unity? Am I praying for your protection against the enemy who wants to destroy your testimony? Am I praying for joy for you? Am I praying for sanctification that you would walk in truth and be Guarded by the truth of God, am I praying for your mission work in the world? And I was so convicted this past week. I thought, Lord Jesus, these are the things you prayed for your disciples. These are the things you want me to pray for your disciples. And these are the things that you want your disciples to pray for one another. What would happen if every member of this church would pray for unity in this body? What would happen if every member of this church would pray for protection, that we would not fall prey to the evil schemes of the enemy? What would happen if every member in this church prayed for joy, that when we see each other, we would be overflowed with the joy of the Lord? What would happen if we prayed for one another to walk boldly in the truth, regardless of the lies of the culture? What would happen if we prayed that every single man, woman, boy, and girl that names the name of Jesus would be serious about the mission call to tell others about Jesus? What would happen? This church would be transformed. This community would be transformed. The churches around us would be transformed. And there's a reason Jesus prays that. And it's so convicted in my own heart this week that now I have a new way to pray for you and to pray for the church. And I want to encourage you this. I want to encourage you in this, that you pray that this next week. You pray those five things for yourself, for your family, for this church, and for our community of believers that the Lord Jesus would be exalted. So Jesus prays for himself. He prays for his disciples. And thirdly, he prays for future disciples. I'm not even jump into that. Here's what he says. He says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. He's praying for future disciples. Do you know, here's the most wonderful thing about the prayer of Jesus that we just read. You were included in that. He prayed for you. You remember there was an old Negro song years ago, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? You remember that? I love that old song because the reality is this. Yes, you were. You were in the garden. You were there when Jesus was praying because he had you in mind. And for every person who will come to faith in Christ, he prayed for them, your children, your grandchildren, your co-workers, your neighbors, included in the prayer of the greatest prayer warrior who ever was. In verse 23, he goes on, the glory that you have given me, I've given to them that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. To whom did he pray? He prayed to the Father. For whom did he pray? He prayed for himself 
and disciples and future disciples. Why did he pray? Here's the last one. Jesus prayed that God would be glorified. He prayed that God would be glorified. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. Every prayer, every prayer should be for the glory of God. Every prayer. Now, what does this mean for us? What does this mean for believers today? Let me tell you, it means two things. I'll close with this. It means Jesus is praying for you right now. He's praying for you. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 says, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. That's an absolute. He always lives. He's seated at the right hand of the Father and he is praying for you today. He's praying for you. He knows your needs. He knows your struggles. He knows your difficulties. He knows all of the pain of your life. Some of you may be thinking, I don't know that he hears me. I've been praying for a long time. I've been struggling with this thing for a long time. Does he really hear me? Does he care? Yes, he cares. He knows every single difficulty of your life better than you do. And he knows what's coming next. And he knows how he is going to use all of these things to chip away the dross and the brokenness of your life to make you who he wants you to be. You need to trust him. He knows you personally. And today he is praying for you. Let me tell you, you're still in his hand. You're still in his hand. And he will never let you go. And he is faithful to the end. But here's the second thing. Jesus is showing you how to pray. Are your prayers for the glory of God? Are you praying for others what Jesus prays for you? Isn't that cool that Jesus is praying for your unity today? That he's praying for your protection. He's praying for your joy. He's praying for your sanctification. He's praying for your mission. And he's calling us to follow the prayer warrior himself. As we're going into Easter Sunday, here's what you need to understand. The last ministry of Jesus on earth before he was hung on the cross is prayer. His ministry now in the presence of the Father is prayer. And he's praying for you. I'm going to ask if you would to stand together and we'll close in a word of prayer. It's appropriate. Father, thank you today for the prayer life of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for showing us through your Holy Spirit, inspiring these words to be written down on our behalf that we can see the heart of Jesus. And Father, we know with confidence that even this morning he's praying for people in this congregation. And Father, as we close this message and we go into a final song, may you remind us all day and in the course of this week that we are never, Father, we're never off of your heart and your mind. And Father, for those who have been struggling, I pray, Father, that today you would bring great confidence to them. That you know. And that the Lord Jesus is lifting them before you even now. And Father, may we find great comfort in that. Father, if there are any here today who don't know Jesus, that today is the opportunity for them to surrender their heart to this King, this Savior, this Redeemer, and that he will forgive them of their sins and bring them into this relationship with you, and they will forever, forever be held by you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.